This webinar is supported by the Global Alliance for Disaster Risk Reduction and Resilience in the Education Sector, CNA, CNA Foundation, Save the Children, and the Global Network of Civil Society Organisations for Disaster Reduction. Now, just to let you know that this webinar will be recorded and we aim to place it up online on the Gadras YouTube channel. So we'll be able to share that link with you after the recording. Now, why are we focusing on advocacy for the first Safe Children, Safe Schools community of this webinar? Well, recent research undertaken by Gadras uh, entitled policy, CSS Policy Trends Across the Asia and the Pacific has found that one of the top facilitators for having uh, school safety policy uh, development as well as implementation is actually advocacy. And it went on to further find that one of the most effective advocates seems to be civil society organisations and NGOs. But how do we actually undertake advocacy and what tools can we use to do that? And this is the focus of this webinar to help us explore some of the tools that GNDR has on offer. So what they look like and to hear about how they've been used in practice. In the meeting invite I shared around, um, you'll see that the policy trends research report is there, as well as some case studies covering some success stories around school safety policy advocacy campaigns. So I encourage you to have a look at them after the webinar. We're very lucky today to be joined by Valeria Drigo from that G. Uh, pardon me, from GNDR. Valeria is an advocacy and learning coordinator there, and she'll run through uh, two tools in particular that GNDR has on advocacy. We're also very lucky to be joined by Hepi Ramawati, who's a programs manager at Yakum Emergency Unit. And Yakum is an Indonesian NGO working in disaster relief and community resilience, and has has used the tools uh, that Valeria will introduce to us. So we'll talk about the tips and tricks that she's learned along the way in using those tools. So at this point, um, I'd like to thank both of our presenters and hand over to Valeria. All right, thank you very much. Um, I hope everyone can hear me. Please shout if you can. Um, thanks so much, Kate. And thank you to Adra Safe Children Safe Schools Initiative for organizing the webinar. I think um, it's always I uh, very for me a very interesting experience both as a, a as I share these tools, but also learning from others who are working with these tools and uh, others who starting their advocacy journey or that have been doing advocacy for some times and sharing their experiences. I always learn something every time I, um, I go through uh, these uh, webinars and I go through these tools. So I'm really looking forward to this, uh, the, to this hour that we have together. Um, so right, uh, I hope you can see the slides. You've, uh, as Kate was saying, you've seen, you've received them before as well. So you should have them with you. Um, I, as Kate said, I work for anyway. GNDR, okay. uh, the Global right. Network of CSOs for Disaster Reduction. Uh, I'm based in London, in the UK. Um, and I mainly deal with advocacy and learning. Um, so I help the network members in their own advocacy activities. I do advocacy at the global level on behalf of the network, and I also uh, try to learn as much as possible from what the uh, CSOs that are part of the network do, so that we, we can, so that I can base my advocacy activities on uh, members' experience. Before uh, going into in the, into this the, the the core of this webinar, just a bit of a housekeeping. Um, 
As you might have seen, if it popped up in your laptop, this webinar is recorded and Kate also mentioned that it will be then shared online. Um, we've shared the slide pack beforehand, so if you don't have access to it, if you can't see the slides, please write something in the chat. Uh, we'll be there to help you. Um, interaction. Let's try to make it interactive as much as possible. It's uh, as an uh, online online meeting is uh, not super easy, but as you know, there is the chat box. Make the most of it. Use it. We are monitoring it. Um, and uh, if you want to speak, feel free. To, uh, request. Oh, sorry. What have I done? Request through the chat box, or you'll see next to your name there's a little hand. If you click on it, it's you're raising your hand and you'll be given the floor. Um, I I will go through this uh, presentation. I'm hoping to keep it within, say, 20 minutes. Um, I'm happy to stop uh, throughout the presentation if anyone has questions. So I'll, I'll do a first uh, introduction to what is advocacy, do advocacy in some of the principles, and then I'll pause for a moment if we or would like to um, to ask any questions and then I'll go through um, some of the tools that GNDR and its members have developed um, and I'll stop um, after uh, going through the tools as well for some questions before giving the floor to Happy who will share her own experience of working in advocacy. Um, I just wanted to maybe try and put my camera on just so you know who you're who you're talking to uh, who's talking to you um not sure if you can all see me i know that the connection might not be very good so um uh i hope you can see me um so maybe i'll just i'll keep it on for for a moment but then i prefer that the slides actually go um that you can focus on the slides and there's no delay in the connection so um Right. As I said before, the what are we going to talk about? So I'll, it, if we were in a room, I would probably ask you all who knows about GNDR, who uh, among you is a member of GNDR and who knows what we do. But um, being online, I'm assuming that um, some of you know about it. I, I've seen through the participants list and I've recognized some names. Um, but I also see a lot of uh, new names, so I will just go through very quickly what GNDR is and what we do. I'll talk about advocacy, what it is, why we do it. I'll focus on where to start, so how do we identify the issue that we want to focus on and clarify the change that we want to see. Um, and then I'll go through some and then I will give the floor to Happy uh, for her experience. Uh, maybe try to mute your mic when you're not speaking so that everyone can uh, can hear everyone else well. Um, I think there is an option for the presenters to mute people as well. Uh, I know it's a bit a bit rude, but it might be needed. <laughs> right, okay. So, what is GNDR? Uh, it's, uh, GNDR is a network of over a thousand organizations that work in over 110 countries. Um, it's the largest international network of CSOs that and disaster risk reduction. We aim to strengthen uh, resilience in communities at the local level worldwide, and we do by working together um, to influence policies and practice, both at international level and at the national, le at the national one. And uh, a lot of junior members work at the local level as well. Um, but we also want to improve our understanding of resilience in DRR. We share knowledge, create and share knowledge through collaborative learning, joint projects, joint programs, actions together. And this also happens at national and international level as well. Um, the, the network, is, uh, anyone can be part of the network. So if you're not and you're interested in joining GNDR and being part of the network, please uh, reach out to us, reach out to me. You'll have my 
um, email address at the end of the presentation. You can uh, just watch um, and I'll tell you what, how to become members. Now, uh, let's dig in. What is advocacy? <laughs> um, advocacy is, uh, it's a process. It's an organized process that uh, aims at influencing uh, selected people uh, achieve a, a change, whether in policy, in practice, in behavior, uh, achieve a change that will benefit a particular group or a particular cause. Um, when we talk about advocacy and campaigning uh, as if they were synonyms, Campaign is definitely related to advocacy. Campaign is a type of advocacy. So um, it, it's an advocacy initiative, or it would be an activity within an advocacy process or uh, within uh, an advocacy plan. But it's not the only way of doing advocacy. Um, it's the most common, I would say. Most of our organizations work uh, to develop advocacy campaign um, as the main, uh, I would say the main action of uh, of an advocacy process but a lot of us especially when uh, working at national level or at international level use other uh, other ways of influencing people like for example lobbying lobbying is a bit of a it's more of a softer um a softer way of it's getting directly in touch with people it's more private rather than public um, and it's yet another way of uh, of doing advocacy of influencing people, but it's not necessarily the only one. I think most importantly, and what, as saying in the beginning, is understanding why we want to do advocacy. And I wonder if let's see if this works. I am going to um, let you, everyone, um, write something on this slide. So. See if I do this. Okay. So you should be able now to write something on this blank slide. And question: Why do we do advocacy? Why do you think advocacy is important? Um, yeah, I see someone started writing something. So if you go on on the left side of your screen, you'll be able to choose the text tool. Yeah, I think Adina is writing in the in the chat box. So if you use the if you select text tool, yeah, exactly for large scale impact. Very good. All right, I'm gonna stop my video now just because I'm a bit concerned that uh, internet might not um, support all of these uh, interaction tools. Yes. So we have an answer for why do we do advocacy for large scale impact. To achieve long long term change, yeah, very right. <laughs> um, to make a sustainable policy change, yes. To have results that are scalable and replicable, yeah. And you can also write in the chat if uh, if annotating is uh, doesn't work for you. But I think you've see you've your. Um, you're touching on quite a few uh, really important points on the reasons why we work so much around advocacy. Um, and I see, yeah, large scale impact, uh, long term change, bring things on to a political agenda, um, doing something that's replicable, mobilizing resources. These are all very good answers. They're very relevant influencing actions and decisions yeah. so if i were to identify um four main reasons why we do advocacy um this would be my four so i am going to stop annotation and move on to the next slide yes so advocacy for me is important because it brings about change as you were saying you know like it raises awareness but it also br bring things to the political agenda um it scales change so it's not it's not something that happens once and that's it we do advocacy because we want we want to institutionalize our change we want to scale it out and we want to make it sustainable so often when we do 
a lot of advocacy initiatives we work on are related to policy policy change and policy change is a change that makes then that, that is sustainable in time because uh legislative change is not that easy to achieve but once achieved it it maintains itself and it transforms power structures as well so by what is the change that we want to see uh, advocacy is a very powerful tool to achieve change and to to make it long term to make it sustainable as you were saying before to influence decisions strengthen policies i'm reading through the chat um yeah policy changes for vulnerable sections so i think the overall is the overall reason why we do advocacy is exactly that is is it's bringing about a change that can be scaled out, can be sustainable, and that transforms society. Some of the principles that uh, our and its members have identified throughout the years in doing advocacy at different levels are these six ones. Um, we've, we've, we've identified uh, these principles as they are, uh, to us, they're, they're prerogative, they're a priority. Advocacy initiatives that don't here to these six principles are less likely to succeed and these are flexibility uh, advocacy initiative needs to be ready to change when necessary say there is a new government you need to to quickly uh, adjust your activities it needs to be credible you, you need to back your asks with evidence with data with information that comes from the ground where the problem is we as Part of a network of a partnership and as uh, me being part of GNDR who's also a network we know that joining hands is the best way to raise our voice to make our voices heard working together <clears throat> works a lot better than working alone it has to be focused clear and simple time identify your one priority and focus on that have a plan be strategic and be context specific adapt it as much as possible to the context that you're working on um, I'm going to stop, pause here for a moment and see if there is anyone who has any questions or who want to comment at this point. You can raise your hand. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Adina's and Kate's help in, in identifying who's raised their hands or just chat or type chat for a question. Am I right in saying there? Oh, sorry, sorry. That uh sorry, I'm looking I'm trying to look through the participants. Alex has raised his hands. Am I right? Alex, would you like to unmute yourself and either ask your question or make your comment? Maybe not. Adam, I would like to share something. Yeah, yeah please. Mm -hmm. Adama? Hello. Hello. Hi. Um, uh, hi. Yeah, I don't know about the collaborative. Yeah, normally we are with uh, different kind of issues about DR. So sometimes it's like, it's not really well known in, let's say, African country. Mm -hmm. There are not numerous, it's, let's say, organization about it in, in Africa. So how can we reach many people about this issue? So Particularly, I think... in, I'm, I'm, I'm from Ivoire, I'm very mm -hmm. so. How can I manage to have? Um, kind of, yeah. I think the the principle of collaboration is um, it is. I think you're 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 right in focusing on this. It's it can be a tricky one. Um, from one one reason would be that uh, you need to have you need to be connected. You need to have the right. Not the right connection, but you need to know who else is working to towards the same change. Who else has your same priorities? And sometimes it's 
it's not easy to identify uh, these actors. Um, the other reason why it's it's a bit tricky is because collaboration always comes at it doesn't come at a cost, but it comes with some challenges. And I think the challenges is that you need to adjust your priorities to other uh, to other prior other people's priorities, and you need to you need trust with one another, and trust takes time. And often we work with very tight timeframes. Uh, our initiatives, our projects don't span uh, throughout years and years. So it's to build trust among each other. But the principle is that most likely you will not be the only one wanting uh, a particular change. Yeah, for sure. uh, there will be others in your country that have uh, similar priorities. And when one organization joins hands with others, then their voice is amplified. One reason uh, you're 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 part of uh, the Save School Save Children initiative, and you're part of Gadris, and this is a network that I'm sure will give you um, will give you access to other people either in the region or in the country who are working on similar issues, or uh, it, it can give you a uh, access to others that even if can support from other regions from other countries where. Similar, um, similar advocacy initiatives have been taking place um, through through the connections within Gadres, within Safe Safe School, Safe Children. You would be able to um, networks, GNDR mm -hmm. being one of them, but also at at your national level, I'm sure. I think mm -hmm. building this this network is probably. Um, the most important thing to make sure that your ad that advocacy is done in a collaborative way because you need to know who else is out there you need to know the actors that are working around the same issues and okay. you don't you can't do it if you don't um a, a network. what organize are you are you you work in Cote d'Ivoire with uh which organization yeah i have my organization okay. i use if student uh, we're dealing with, uh, let's say, training of people, peoples about, uh, let's say, resilience and also pollution, right. those kind of things. Okay. We can people about it. Uh, yeah. Helen, just to let you know, there is a second question from Mintu. Yes, please. Uh, to feel free to yourself or type in the chat box as you prefer. Um, well, uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll move on. Uh, just. Make sure that your your question is uh, you you type your question in the chat uh, or if you want to also ask it later there will be um, other opportunities to interact as well. I'm just a bit conscious of time and we have an hour together. We don't have. Hello, this is Mintu. Oh hi, yes. Hello. Yeah, I think connection is not good enough, Valeria. Please continue. Okay. Um, okay, so... So, I, I'll... Maybe I'll go through uh, all of these steps to design a, a... So, we've... So, this is focusing on designing an advocacy campaign, but... In any advocacy initiative, I think these five steps are the ones to consider and you need to consider that going through the steps takes time, but also the tools that can help you go through each uh, of these uh, in a way and making sure that you're achieving results. So, um, as you might have, if, if you have opened the slide pack that was sent to you, um, you'll see that there are, there are some examples or maybe some short exercises for the uh, issue analysis and for clarifying the change. 
So we had developed um, exercising using two of the tools. We'll not go through them right now, but uh, I think these are useful as a as a guidance if you have never used these tools before. Um, they're useful to see what type of information these tools can give you and how they've um, how they can be used. Um, I'll anyway focus probably on issue analysis and clarifying the change because I think this is the the building blocks of any advocacy initiative. And if these are not, uh, if we don't get these right, then the rest of our activities are 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 not going to be successful. But that are shared that there are tools for all of these different uh, all of these different steps. Right. So uh, structure these lines. You'll have a set of questions, guiding questions that you want to keep in mind when you start your advocacy journey, um, and a few tools that you can refer to to help you in in this process. Um, there is a lot more about these different tools in uh, the uh, National Advocacy Toolkit that GNDR developed together with its partners. And I think there's a link at the end of the slides. Uh, I think it was also shared by email before the webinar. So focus too much in details into each of them, but um, I'm also happy to go through uh, some of these tools if anyone is particularly interested in one of them. So the issue analysis is the first thing that uh, one needs to do uh, when uh, starting an advocacy initiative, which is identifying exactly what is that you want to focus in. What's the problem? Uh, what are the causes and consequences of the problem? Uh, why do you want? Why do you want this problem to? Wh why do you want to change this issue? Um, what are some of the factors that will be help you? That will help in uh, achieving this change. What are, who could be your allies and your opponents? Um, there's different tools that can be used and each of these will give you, uh, will help you in a specific issue. So the problem objective three help in understanding uh, the root of a problem, the solutions, um, transforming, understanding first, what is the, the issue that you want to deal with? What are the causes and the consequences of this issue? And then it helps you uh, converting it into what is the uh, the change that you want, what would be the conditions that make this change happen, and what are the results of it. Um, the fishbone analysis tool help you identify connections among the different causes. So it could be uh, one, you, you could identify a specific cause and you could identify a set of causes and then this still helps you understanding what is connected to what, so that if you change one, it has an impact and an effect another one as well. Um, the policy analysis is specific to uh, advocacy. So when you work in, when you want to advocate for a change in policy, this still helps you analyzing what policies are already out there and what is the best way, uh, the most effective policy change that you'd want. Um, and clarifying the changes is steps. This step helps you in um, in really understanding what are short term, medium term, long term changes that will lead you to the overall change that you want to see. Um, it helps you understand what your role is, uh, what progress look like, what are some of the assumptions that you're working on, what are um, the different the different steps that will lead you there. And it also helps understanding what success will look like, because I think often we focus on the process of doing advocacy, but it's really important to also be able to see, to visualize the change so that you can work towards it and you can see when you have achieved it. So scenario imagining is one of these tools. The first one is here in the slides that helps you exactly doing that. It helps you clarifying how the world would look like if you had achieved your goal, if you have achieved the change you wanted. Um, for this field analysis, um, it's a tool that uh, it helps you think through what are factors that would help your advocacy and what are factors that would hinder your advocacy. Um, this all seem, uh, they're actually, despite the, the, the names and uh, simple, but they give you um, 
a guidance in terms of questions or mind frames that help you then putting everything together and planning for success. I think the most used tool though in, in, this, uh, in this step of developing an advocacy initiative is the theory of change. The theory of change is a tool that helps you map how you will get to the change you want, looking at what would be the precondition for that change, what are the long-term goals that help you achieve that, and what are some medium-term goals that help you achieve the longer-term ones, and the short-term goals that help you achieve the, me the, the medium-term ones. So trickling down, basically, it, 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 helps, it helps putting a um, thing together and it helps you then planning activities for each of the different goals. It also helps you understanding what would be some indicators to then measure progress towards these different goals. I'll, I'll be a bit quicker. This, the remaining three uh, steps. The message development uh, is once you've, once you've identified what is it you want to achieve, how you're going to do it, uh, focus on your target audience, focus on uh, how you're going to develop your messages and focus on who should deliver the messages and what is needed. So this is where in an advocacy process, you would want to work more with your uh, colleagues that work in communications. You'd want their support in understanding how to develop simple, clear, that get uh, your, your advocacy priorities across to different audiences. And here as well, you'd have different tools. You can have a look at them more in details in, uh, in the slides or in the National Advocacy Toolkit. Once you've clarified, it's time to plan your activities lobby are you going to campaign um will you will, will you will you direct with the people that are making the change that you want or will you uh raise awareness among the public will you ask for public support uh will you go out in the streets or will you have private meetings what activities will help you achieve your short-term medium-term and long-term goals um, work plans are, I think, the most used tools for anything, whether it's a project, whether it's a program, whether it's an advocacy initiative, and it's no, it's no different. Yeah, in advocacy, it's it's no different. It's just that the 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 way of planning activities needs to be mindful of the work you have done before in understanding the issue and understanding the change. Uh, we shared uh, um, a template for planning uh, advocacy initiatives and the different activities. You should have received it by email. Uh, I think there's also a link at the end of the slides. And that, um, that's a good guideline for you to know one step by step what needs to be done. Um, last but not least, monitoring and evaluation and learning. If we don't learn from what we've done, we're never going to be better. We're never going to have more successful, successful advocacy initiatives in the future. And I think for any advocacy activities, what's important is that you need to be able to see the small changes. Um, you need to be, you need to follow progress. Um, and you need to know what small changes look like. I think one of the issues, especially when working with policy change, is that it's really hard to see, uh, you know, like a, a, a big impact until the end of it. How are you going to measure that you're going, that you're in the right track, that you're going in the right direction? Um, how are you, how are you going to be able to adjust your, your activities based on different, based on, I don't know, changes in policies or changes in government? Um, you need to have milestones within the process where you stop what you've done and the indicators that you've set for the short term or the medium term initiatives and, and check for achieving them. Are you, are, you, are you almost there? Are you on the right track? Um, don't wait until the end of an activity to, um, to check whether it was successful or not. Do so also at the end. Uh, make sure you reflect on how the uh, initiative went Make sure you draw some lessons learned. Easy way to is, yeah, ask yourself what worked well, what didn't work well, what was important for success of this initiative, what were some of the barriers, 
what would I do different next time? Make sure you write this down, record them, maybe have a chat with everyone else that has um, that has supported you in the initiative. Um, make sure these are somewhere that are accessible next time you're planning an advocacy initiative and that you include some of the lessons learned in the future. So I will stop. Um, here are some the, some of the links. You should have them. If you don't have them, please uh, shout to Kate, Dina, or myself. Um, I think I will maybe pause here for a moment. See if there is um, if there's anyone who has any. And after I will give the floor to Happy, so that you have a uh, you'll you'll hear from her some of her experience in using these tools and. Uh, some of her experience in developing advocacy initiatives. But first, if you have any uh, questions or comments, please feel free. Again, either raise your hand or type the chat. I see. Oh, there was a um, on the principles. I think Gilles, Gilbert, you wrote. We need to consider community and leadership mobilization using the community action cycle as first step. Includes identifying the core groups who are interested and affected, those who will come up and own the community mobilization goals and activity, achieve a critical mass for the desired change at all level. I think that's your that's a really good point. And indeed, uh, it also helps um, it also helps when you're looking at your allies and your opponents. Who would help you in the campaign, who would help in the initiative, who who might create some barriers? And mobilizing community is definitely uh, an important activity. You need to plan it in advance. Mobilize it from the start. Work with the community to understand what the issues are, what the changes that you want to see are. Uh, make sure it reflects what their priorities are as well. So thanks for raising it. Very important. Minto would have liked a little bit more on the principle to better understand why flexibility is so important. Yes. So, um, flexibility is, is key, especially when working on, on policy on policy changes, because circumstances can change quite quickly. And often an advocacy initiative is not something that is achieved within, uh, within three months or six months. It often takes quite some time. We're, remember, remember that we're doing advocacy to influence change in the long term. Uh, to to change the power structure dynamics to change policies and these are long term processes and within this time frame so many things can change i think one of the most the, probably the the more straightforward example is if throughout the period of your advocacy initiative there are new elections and there is a sudden change in government priorities change this needs to be reflected in in and say you are trying to advocate for a policy change so you are you are advocating directly to the government if there's a change in government's priorities in its in its agenda you need to just either how your messages are delivered or how your messages are structured or maybe also some of the activities some of the core activities of your own initiative um and I think this is uh, this is probably something that uh, I may imagine Happy has experienced. <laughs> um, uh, a lot of uh, our members have experienced that, especially when uh, initiatives take quite a longer time. What is the key part of strategy in advocacy? The key part of strategy. Um, oh, is as one of the principles. I think the the reason why strategic is one of the principles is because um, advocacy is a process and as every process is, it needs to be planned out well. It needs to be uh, one isolated or ad hoc, ad hoc uh, initiative that would not have the same impact as an advocacy process that goes, uh, that goes on longer than includes different initiatives. Um, if you have a plan that's based on, you know, a solid understanding of the issue that takes into account the context, that takes into account the capacity of your partners, of your allies, um, the clear goal uh, will help success. And I think this is what this is what we mean when we say the strategic that uh, uh, good advocacy should be strategic. The strategy should be uh, 
of an advocacy process. Chandan, about pillar three, risk reduction and resilience education, how advocacy initiative will work for it with government department and children? I think this is a, put Kate on the spot here. I think this is a question for that Kate is better place to answer. I think it relate does it, it relates to what Gadra's, um, some of Gadra's activities, if I'm not wrong. So pillar three in the comprehensive school safety framework, we look at three pillars. So we focus on um, safe learning facilities and then school disaster management and then three, which is risk reduction and resilience education. And each of those three pillars have different actors who are involved. So Chandan's pointed out that um, within pillar three, it's often Department of Education and um, the children, the um, Themselves, the teachers um, and the schools and from each different level from local right up to national and within the Department of Education it's often the curriculum folk who are often quite different to school disaster management. So um, the question here is um, working with all the different people within an advocacy campaign. Is that right, Chandan? I think it probably is. And I just went back to a slide on message development because you, uh, you'd you see here that there is a, um, I think the first tool presented is uh, power mapping where you see there's decision makers, there's others, um, our agenda, other conflicting agendas. I think this is um, a really good tool when you work with different actors that might have, you know, different priorities or different interests or that would relate to the issue in different ways. This helps you mapping out where they stand and what is the strength. So every, whether it's a government, whether it's a community or the, the children in, in school, they have their own strength that they can bring if they're potential partners. Um, uh, some of their, some characteristics that you'd need to be aware of if they are opponents, um, and placing them in this, in this map, in this conceptual map is quite helpful in, in the sense that it, um, how to better leverage everyone's, uh, everyone's different, everyone's unique strengths and, um, and what they bring to the table. Um, Kate, I'm just wondering, do you, do you, uh, I think maybe sh should we have, uh, should we let Happy uh, talk a bit through her experience and then maybe we can go on with a couple, with a few more questions. Uh, like, a, like a good idea and I'm sure Happy's presentation will raise further questions and queries. Um, Happy. Oh. Hi. How are Hi, you doing? Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Oh. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Happy uh, from Yakum Emergency Unit, a uh, member of the NDR from Indonesia. Uh, today, I will share uh, our organization experience uh, when we uh, do the advocacy using the uh, some tools that has been uh, provided by GNDR, uh, especially on. Uh, uh, on the uh, emergency response that we uh, that we have done uh, in Central Sulawesi, which is affected by earthquake, tsunami, and liquefaction. So uh, the main issues is that the person with disability are invisible at times of emergency or during disaster response and recovery period. And uh, if and if and and they are much more neglected during the non-disaster situation. Uh, this is uh, due to poor disaster affected uh, database and uh, low awareness uh, of the government and also the community uh, about uh, the needs of uh, the different needs of uh, people with disabilities. <laughs> 
So uh, within our organizations, uh, we uh, we make uh, uh, an issue analysis on what are the uh, what uh, what what is happening and what can we do uh, to make the emergency response uh, done by our organizations and also by the government and other civil society organizations uh, to to have a um, a better response uh, we, how to ensure the accessibility in humanitarian response and how uh, to ensure meaning, meaningful participation of persons with disability in humanitarian response so uh, we uh, we uh, start with uh, our own uh, our own uh, internal mapping we call it internal mapping so to see uh, what can we do with our uh, own existing uh, resources. Uh, so we start with disability awareness campaign using the momentum of International Disability Day, uh, where we invited uh, look uh, where we invited uh, local government, then the humanitarian responder, and also the people with disabilities themselves, uh, and also. Uh, Said, uh, disabled uh, people organization uh, to have uh, a one day campaign on uh, disability awareness in humanitarian response which is attended by 500 uh, people at that time in December and after we do the campaign uh, we uh, start to know more actors that have a commitment uh, to ensure inclusive uh, humanitarian response. So uh, the we initiated disability inclusion platform uh, consists of uh, several uh, humanitarian organizations that have a strong interest on uh, disability inclusion in emergency re in humanitarian response and. Uh, so just a uh, few days ago, uh, we uh, conducted uh, a workshop uh, with this uh, platform, disability inclusion platform, to identify uh, to identify the uh, the the issues uh, using the tools, uh, also using the tools with the GMBR to identify. Uh, first is to identify the issues. Then the second is to identify network resources, and then also uh, do the uh, program and policy analysis. analysis. Uh, so that we know uh, which uh, program that we can, uh, which, which government or other or, uh, organization program uh, that can uh, that can be uh, a resource uh, that, that we can utilize uh, to ensure that humanitarian uh, response. Uh, will consider uh, disability inclusion and which uh, policies that we need to influence to ensure that uh, people with uh, disability is not left behind. So uh, after we do the mapping, then we come up with uh, uh, three collective priority of actions. Uh, one is uh, we, we will continue the, the uh, disability inclusion campaign using, using evidence-based that uh, we will collect. Uh, for example, we will make a, uh, a, a, a research a source, a research uh, on uh, the added value of uh, of uh, disability in inclusion programming in humanitarian response, uh, and also uh, we uh, what are the uh, what are the we also make a research on uh, what are the added value and social analysis of using uh, universal design in uh, in uh, in was uh, in latrine in universal universal design in water and sanitation program and we also the second is uh, on advocacy uh, on policies influence we have identified uh, what kind of uh, national policy that we need to influence. For example, uh, 
the the amendment of uh, disaster management law to ensure that uh, disability uh, inclusion is there and also uh, to uh, to promote uh, the utilization of Washington group uh, set of uh, questionnaire uh, into the uh, into the disaster affected uh, community database and also ensure that uh public services and disaster management uh, regulation are uh, also uh, also uh, uh, sensitive to the needs of people with disability the third uh, priorities of uh, actions that we have is to provide capacity building uh, for for uh, national local government and humanitarian responder as well as, well as people with disability and their families on uh, on uh, inclusion of people with disability uh, for example uh, for for the for the government we will provide uh, technical assistance on how to make the contingency planning is uh, considering uh, uh, the needs of people with disability or also uh, provide assistance during uh, rapid assessment uh, to ensure that the needs of people with disability are identified and fulfilled uh, in the future uh, response. And we also uh, will provide a service for uh, out, uh, which is called, which is so-called uh, accessibility audit. So, um, uh, an overview uh, about uh, what has been done uh, and what and what need to be uh, what need to be improved by the uh, the governments and the humanitarian actors in terms of uh, disability inclusion. Uh, so uh, we also uh, within the platform we also uh, try to identify what are the existing resources so that we could uh, what is it we could uh, uh, for example we could also fulfill uh, the gap of uh, the needs from people with disability during, uh, during emergency and also recovery phase for example when uh, one organization is conducting uh, assessment on assistive device uh, and then uh, we will inform uh, how many people with disability that need assistive device and we will inform to other organizations uh, who also have assistive device uh, so that it can be distributed to uh, people with disability that need the assistive device. So uh, this uh, uh, one example on uh, on how we use the tools uh, in the emergency response, but we also use uh, the tools uh, on theory of change uh, to to make a proposal on a DRR program on DRR program uh, and uh, so that it uh, it uh, help uh, us to uh, to develop a better proposal which is approved by our donor so uh, actually the the tools uh, provided is not only for advocacy but also uh, meaning uh, advocacy on uh, policy changes uh, but also uh, to uh, to uh, to collect uh, resources uh, from donor or from other uh, partner yeah um so uh, any questions or <laughs> yeah thank thanks yeah, and oh, um, sorry mm -hmm. go on and uh, lastly, we also uh, identify what are the strategic upcoming events uh, that we need to attend and influence. Uh, for example, there will be a locally led inclusive humanitarian response workshop uh, that will be uh, done in Central Sulawesi. And then uh, at the regional level, uh, there will be a regional conference uh, on inclusive humanitarian response, which is uh, led by the 
the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, in uh, so all of the so this is like a diplomatic uh, event uh, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Asia, uh, which uh, where they will talk about the inclusive humanitarian response. So we will also come to the uh, workshop. And the, and the third is uh, the regional conference on uh, humanitarian localizations, which is uh, happening in Jakarta. So uh, we also uh, uh, map, mapping out the uh, the specific events that we need to attend. And we, uh, with, with our platform, we identify uh, who will attend what event and what are the methods that we will need to uh, to uh, voice uh, during the workshop. Um, thanks, Happy. Um, it's Valerie here again. Thank you so much. I think it's 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 really for me. It's always really interesting to hear experiences of using these different tools in practice. Um, a question that someone wrote in, that Wilfred wrote in the chat that I think might be I might turn to you, Happy, to answer this. Um, Wilfred says, uh, I would like some methodologies that can be used to measure impact of DRR advocacy. I think that's, um, that's often a challenge. Um, measuring impact of advocacy is, is quite a challenge. And in disaster risk reduction, the impact of a good advocacy would be that, you know, like that there's no disaster. So you'd have to measure something that doesn't happen. Um, I wonder if. In your experience, happy. How have you, how have you been, work? How have you been measuring the impact of the different advocacy activities that you've been, uh, that you've been doing? If you're talking, you're muted. To unmute the mic. Okay, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. So there are different levels of advocacy. So it's not only about influencing the policies, but it's also, uh, it can be, uh, from the awareness level and then it could be at the budgeting level, uh, policy levels, uh, that kind of thing. So, uh, for the awareness, uh, raising, uh, of course, uh, uh, we measure on, uh, uh, how, uh, how much, uh, new, new, uh, how we call it, um, uh, new, new allies that, that, uh, that can be, uh, can, that can be, uh, works together for the, the future, uh, activities that could also measure the awareness. So, and also uh, how is the, uh, perceptions of the, for example, the, uh, the family or the community towards an issue is also, uh, this also can be uh, can be used to measure uh, the 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 changes. And at the budgeting level, uh, for example, uh, when we had our DRR program, uh, we measure the advocacy uh, by uh, by uh, ensuring that the village government or the local government allocate uh, budgets for preparedness. Or, uh, or for uh, disaster re uh, reduction activities, or for example, the community is uh, 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 voluntarily uh, join the disaster task force and do uh, annual mock drill. That can, uh, so it it depend on the activities that we have. And for the policies, uh, we also, uh, of course, uh, what kind of uh, we uh, we have. Um, we ask to the government uh, what needs to be included in the policy, what needs to be changed, and um, uh, how these uh, changes is uh, accommodated by the government. Thank you. Um, some, uh, especially you know, like measuring how many new allies you have uh, every time you you work on advocacy. I think that's a great way to see. Um, impact at a maybe at a shorter term, uh, not as mm -hmm. such a long term as a change in policy. Um, so I think uh, there are some other questions that I've seen uh, written in the chat, and um, 
I think probably because uh, time is running and uh, we're, we're basically uh, we'll probably note them down and follow up via email so we can respond to uh, the various questions, the comments that have been asked by email. Um, I might uh, check with Kate whether you want to close this or whether you'd want to have um, a, a few more minutes if there is comments or other questions. Yeah, over to you, Kate. Thank you, Valeria, and thank you, Happy, for your presentation as well. Um, conscious of time, it is it is time, so we might close it now and um, catch up with everyone over email with those remaining questions. But before you leave, I would ask if you could um, pull us out by completing a quick poll. Adina will get the poll up now. So the questions are up there now. Um, if you just answer, I believe there's four different questions. So if you um, have the time, if you could respond to those questions, that would be. Thank you everyone for joining the first Safe Children, Safe Schools Community Practice webinar. It's been great to have you join and to participate and we look forward to joining future webinars and activities. And if you have any questions, comments, feedback, feel free to reach out to either myself, Adina or Valeria. We really look forward to hearing from you. So thank you everyone and have a good morning, afternoon, evening, wherever you are around the world. Thanks. Um, I just want also wanted to thank you all. Uh, I think the polling is still uh, going, so um, just yeah, just a word of thanks uh, to to and to God School Safe Children Initiative. I think um, it was great that it was organized. I I really enjoy the interactions. I enjoy hearing from your comments, your questions. I've seen a lot going on through the chat. I'm sorry that uh, I haven't been able to read everything out loud, but I will go through it afterwards. Um, thanks to Happy for for joining us, for sharing her experience. Um, very very insightful, very interesting, and I hope it was uh, it was useful for you all as well. Um, and yeah, as Kate was saying, uh, just reach out to us for any follow up. Um, Kate, I think we're. Is, is the time of the polling over? Uh, we have two more minutes of the polling, but if, you, if you've completed the polling, feel free to log out.